The entire process, um, this, was a, this was really quick. I mean, this movie, I wrote it last summer. We were in pre-production in November, like this time around, roughly, uh, of last year. And then we were shooting by the first week of January, and we were done by the end of February. And the film was at TIFF in September, like dripping wet print. We, we mixed it. I think like the final mix was I think a week before um, we came to TIFF. So it was <clears throat> basically a calendar year, the whole thing. But that's really qu I mean, that's quick and weird and but you, you usually knew takes the, a lot longer. You knew the novel it was based on well before that. Yeah, I'd read yeah. the novel in high school. Yeah. yeah. Um, right there? My foreign sales agent and my distributors did not want a movie called Notre Dame de Grasse. So I actually stole this title from another script of mine. Uh, weirdly, I have like three movies that could be called Good Neighbors, and apparently this is the one that's going to be Good Neighbors. Yeah, but no, it, like we still call it, like I still call it Notre Dame. Like we all kind of call it Notre Dame. That's the that was the movie that we uh, that was the title that we were uh, working under. Yeah, and sorry, it's a way better title too. That's the title in Quebec, right? Yeah, yeah. in French. Yeah, in Quebec. Yeah. yeah. Right there. Uh, the lady's question was about uh, um, some of the remarks you made in the press about the. The color palette of Quebecois uh -huh. cinema. My scandal. Yeah. Um, and how and other filmmakers? Yeah, responded other filmmakers to? have responded great. I mean, other filmmakers in general agree with me. I mean, one of the coolest things that happened was that right. I, I did not expect any of that to happen. I uh, I was at the you know the U.S. premiere or whatever of Trotsky, and uh, I gave that interview to a guy <clears throat> after a couple of martinis and. Um, uh, he, I didn't even think I'd g gave him, given him anything he could write about. And then I got home and that Tuesday morning, this was like the week, I was gone on the weekend and then I got home and the Tuesday morning, I was on the front page of La Presse. And what's crazy about Quebec is like, <clears throat> there is nothing I could say to get on the front page of the Globe and Mail. Like I would, I would have to become a terrorist to get on the front page of the Globe and Mail. But like to comment on culture and make the front page of, I think it's cool that in Quebec th those kind of conversations take place. Um, but the first person to defend me, uh, <clears throat> or to defend my position, I suppose, on the radio was Philippe Fallardo, um, who is a, an amazing director and, um, and a friend of mine, but not somebody, I didn't ask him to do this, and uh, not someone that I would have assumed, I don't know, I, didn't, I, I was surprised that he, had, that he took, took it upon himself to call into a radio talk show to, uh, agree, to support me and agree with me. I think that among filmmakers, it's pretty obvious what I'm saying that like it's just obviously true um, if you watch TV in Quebec and you go to the movies you would never know that there was anybody that wasn't white and French um, in the province and I think it's changing Sodec uh, which is our funding agency in Quebec is really good about <clears throat> seeking out and trying to promote diversity um, uh, there's just, you know, a lot of this conversation is generational, too. Like, people above the age of 50 are not going to agree with me um, among French intellectuals. It's just not going to happen. Um, and not only that, but it's hard for them to even feel like I get a say. Like, they, I'm still an outsider um, who shouldn't really be allowed to be part of this conversation. Um, but among young people, I think it's just, like, obvious. Like, the first few notes that I got, the way, the way that I found out I was on the front page of the newspaper was by, my, by getting a series of text messages on my phone um, in the morning um, from the weirdest collection of people who were like, good for you, I agree with you. But they were all like, good for you, I agree with you. And I didn't know what they were talking about. Um, and then I went to the Depenner and I found out. But yeah. It, but the support am among industry people has been really cool, very good. Um, the support in the press has been not. Right there? Yeah, Quebec is important to me. I mean, I'm from Quebec. I consider myself Quebecois. Like, Quebec concerns me. You're asking about why the, the oh, separate... Oh, my, my, my politics on... Why the why the well, why is the, the referendum, referendum in there? The backdrop. Yeah, um, that's totally fair. Um, it's there because <clears throat> when I first read this book was during the referendum, and for whatever reason, those two ideas kind of conflated for me, and they became very important uh, and linked. Um, I thought it was <clears throat> uh, it's an interesting time in Montreal. Montreal was. Um, are, are you from Montreal? Yeah, so you may remember it like it was really depressing. Uh, Montreal, the economy was awful. Um, the neighborhood I grew up in, NDG, was full of busy, going out of business store. Like every third store was open on the streets. Um, it was just a, it was a tense time. 
And also, there's something that I found interesting about the signage and the kind of propaganda. Like, I love the idea of a yes-no choice. That's what I think is interesting about a referendum, is that you only get two choices. And one of the things that I liked about it for this film is that that's, in kind of in movie language, there's the illusion that she has two choices, one guy or another. And really, she doesn't quite, I don't think, pick either of them. Um, but, it, like, you know, in a kind of a traditional three-person, one-girl, two-guy setting, this is, these are the obvious choices. So I wanted to use that as a bit of a parallel but um no it's there for it's there for background it's not i don't think it plays out um politically uh, um except in the sense that it's about three anglophones living in montreal during that time uh, and two of them are decidedly not interested in the referendum or any other people or really. anything <laughs> at all yeah which i think is what i, I love that backdrop because there's this whole like you know intense focus on how this is how the society is structured and what connections it has and then two of the principals just don't care they just they don't care yeah yeah uh, sure. whether in english or french or whatever yeah and i could never have cast jay to play one of the people that doesn't care because there's nothing jay barishall cares about more than that conversation um we talk about it on set a lot because it's funny you know to have somebody like michelin lancto there with with jay like i was always terrified if I saw them talking alone together. I was just like, oh God, what are they talking about? I hope it's not politics. Like, come on, I'll over here, you, over here. Next? At the back there? She, yeah. The question she was about what happened with Vincent and Louise and the sperm sample. And yeah. Et cetera. Victor. Um, yeah. Sorry, Victor. Uh, that's Sorry. okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, there's no sperm in the book. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't actually happen. Um, she, uh, it, yeah, it, it's weird. Like, the, the book... The book does this thing with the rape where the rape is played up at the beginning and then it's dropped. By the time Louise goes to do her thing, it's just kind of skipped over. And I had, um, I had an enormous internal debate over what to do. Like, I didn't, I didn't know if there was even going to be rape in the movie at all. If he was just going to be a serial killer and I was going to take the, the rapist part of it out. Um, and uh, two, two people convinced me to keep it in, two very smart uh, screenwriters, uh, both of whom are women, but... I don't think that's, that was what did. Ultimately, uh, they were just like, it's a part of the fabric of the story, and I couldn't really let it go either. But part of my big um, internal dialogue was, well, if I'm going to make a big deal about this guy being a rapist, and, she, and she's obsessed with this killer, she's going to know that she's got to rape this woman. Because you can't just pin it on a serial... You can't tr like ha go halfway with being a serial killer or pretending you're a serial killer. Um, and then it became that a huge sequence. Um, the way I think about the sperm, though, in specific, in particular, rather, is um, A, there was no forensic testing. Of the t like, that stuff didn't really exist at the time in 95. The first time it was used in a trial in Canada was in 96. So it, was like, it wasn't quite CSI time. And second of all, I don't think she gives a shit. I think she would happily be like, oh, yeah, oh, he did that. I oh, that's too bad. I'll keep the cat, you know, and like send him off to jail. Yeah, but she's not thinking about Victor, I don't think. Uh, Three-part question. One was uh, what the budget was. Uh, uh, next was, uh, do you use the story editor or what the process is for developing the script? And three, uh, and lastly, me, how is it with the cats? Let me get the cats first. It's awful. It's terrible. I don't recommend it. Um, they're a nightmare. They don't do anything that you want them to do. But then occasionally they do things like that, you know, the overhead shot where Jay gets into bed next to Emily and the cat, like, curls around and, like, sleeps between the two of them. Like, sometimes that shit happens, and then you're like, oh, cat, I love you. And then you spend four hours trying to get it to jump off a window ledge, and you want to kill yourself. Um, it's, they're, very, they're, they're very difficult to work with. Um, they, animals are always difficult to work with. And I, told, I did a movie when I was a teenager with a dog, and I learned very quickly that it doesn't really matter how good you are in that shot. If the dog does what the dog is supposed to do, that's going to be in the movie. So I told the cast, I was like, if those cats are doing their thing, you better act properly because otherwise you're going to suck in the movie. Because if the cat does the thing it has to do, then that's going to go, that's going to happen. And I really tried to keep it simple. Like I was like, eat, sleep, curl up. Like I wasn't like, you know, they're not superhero cats. Um, but it was, it was trying and, and difficult. I mean, the fish were hard too. The cannibal fish got depressed. We had to bring in a fish therapist at one point. I, I'm not kidding you. We had to bring in somebody to talk to the fish, a fish whisperer, um, because the, the fish was at the bottom of his tank and he wouldn't eat and he wouldn't swim. And he's the cannibal fish. Anyway, we gave him some friends and he got better they, and he killed one of them and that made him happy. Um, okay, the budget of the movie is about 5.2 million. 
um, f f a little over five. So that's the um, that's that, and then yeah, no story editor on this. No, I don't, I don't, I don't particularly work with story editors so much. But I do have a group of people like who are my readers, like uh, people who are my friends and who are my and colleagues, uh, who read my scripts and give me notes, and we, I talk about it with them. Um, one of the most important people being Emily Hampshire, who the actress who's a brilliant reader, and is amazing. She read every draft of this script. And um, Karen Walton, who's a very good friend of mine, who's a screenwriter as well. She reads, I read all her scripts, she reads all my scripts. Um, I, I know a lot of screenwriters and we tend to exchange our work and you get kind of, you accumulate notes and, and opinions and stuff on, 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 uh, on your drafts. And you know, different people read at different times, but uh, Karen, is, and Karen and Emily are two people who read every draft for me, um, which is great. And Karen wrote uh, Ginger Snaps yeah. and Jane Doe, and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, she's a great a great writer. But she's also really good at things that I'm not good at, like structure. And she's very because she wrote for TV for many years as well. I wrote with her on TV actually, and she taught me a lot. But there's you know she's really good at you know if there's a hole in a script and you don't quite know what's what the problem is, she's the kind of person who can be like, oh, well, you skipped this step, you you missed your turn, you missed. It's actually the beginning of the second act, and you still think you're in the first act, and that's why you feel this lag here. And so she's a terrific reader. And she was also the person I talked to the most about the idea of rape in the movie. God, I don't question know. was about the software and the motion God, graphics. I, I and do not know. That's just a reel out. No, that's just, that happens in camera. That's just, um, it's the end of a reel. Um, yeah. The rollout, I guess we call it. Um, yeah, this is the end of the mag, and there's just like a couple of frames, and yeah, I used them. At the back. Question is about the international distribution and how involved you are with it. Yeah, um, I mean, inv I'm in as involved as I can be. We have a foreign sales agent, a very good company called Myriad, who's handling that. The film is going to open theatrically in the States and here. Um, usually, in general, with international distribution, they want to secure a U.S. deal before they start going out into the world because they can make more money if they have a U.S. deal in place, and they can make less money if they don't. So, um, I mean, I'm hopeful. I'm, you know, every movie I make, I'm hopeful will open as many places as it possibly can, or be able to be seen by as many people as, as it can. You know, I mean, that's. I wish for the whole thing. Um, realistically, I can imagine this movie could open theatrically in like a few European countries, maybe Australia. Maybe some places like that, and then it'll probably be on DVD and other places. How important are festivals to that strategy? Well, I mean, it depends. <clears throat> What's important is where you start. Like, starting a TIFF is a big deal. Um, after that, it becomes a less big, and I think it, it, like, it, it, it diminishes in importance because, you know, y usually there's a sales launch and kind of things happen from them. And so TIFF, and then there's the American film market, which is, like, now-ish, um, which is usually a big time as well. And then... Uh, what happens, I mean, at least with a movie like this one, what's going to happen is then you start going to festivals in places where you've been bought to launch the film, for them to bank press for whenever they decide to re release the film. Um, but at a pl if you start at a festival, like a, an, you know, what people call an A-list festival, you have a way better chance of that stuff happening to you than if you don't. Um, yeah, sure. Film has not been re-edited at all. I mean, unless, I don't know, I didn't watch it. Did, was it, is it different? Okay, then it's fine, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Can somebody sneak in and cut my movie? Yeah, it's, it's actually longer. It's yeah, I, know, I was going to say, it's pretty short. No, the only thing that would happen would be my editor. The film used to open with this large car crash, and, um, which is like a flashback sequence to how Spencer gets in the wheelchair. So it's Scott Speedman and Jessica Parry driving down a road, and they get into a big car accident, and Jessica dies, and Scott becomes Spencer or whatever becomes a demon and I cut that out of the film and my editor hates me. My editor thinks that I'm like the only person in the world who would cut a car crash out of a movie um, and he might be right about that but that would that would be the only thing that anyone... Uh, we, we used, unlike Trotsky, um, we used I think almost every scene that we shot and I don't think that there is. There's no like additional footage of this movie. But yeah, no, it hasn't changed. What's changed are the, uh, the, cre the closing credits. We had to, re we had to redo them. That was maybe what you were under the impression was different.